Hi, I'm Martha Nowak. Welcome to K-State Olathe. We have as our guest speaker, Dr. Beth Davis, um, who is going to talk with us today about equine case studies. So if you'll help me welcome Dr. Davis. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And so I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about certainly horses. How many people are horse people? Horse. All right. All right. <laughs> so we've got a few. But just, you know, touching on veterinary medicine as well. I know that if you've been attending sessions in this series, um, you guys probably have some interest in veterinary medicine. Anybody here think that they're headed for maybe going to veterinary college someday? Okay. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. So um, I hope you find this uh, informative. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So pretty informal. If you have a question during, please feel free to raise your hand after. Um, similarly. All right. We are just not having any. <laughs> oh, how so about click, click on it there you go. with the mouse and then remote will actually, after the first slide, should advance it. Uh, technology. Okay, so we were going to have some little clicker devices, but the technology was not cooperating today. And so, um, a show of hands, anybody know how many horses there are approximately in the United States? How many for A? B? C? 100,000? Seems like a lot, doesn't it? A million? Okay, got a few for a million, 10 million. Okay, excellent, excellent. So 10 million is probably our closest estimate. Um, we don't know exactly how many horses there are. This is something that the National American Horse Council would like to do is have a regular census of how many horses there are in this country. Um, but there are quite a few, probably between nine and 10 million at any given time. And so just a little bit of history on horses in the United States. So way back, a long, long time ago, in the early 1900s, there were a lot of horses. Why do you think there were a lot of horses? Did we have cars? Because people hadn't started killing them yet. Because people hadn't started killing them yet to use them for stuff a whole lot as much? Well, um, because at that time, they were actually really important for work purposes, okay? So they were used for a lot of different reasons, transportation, work on farms, those sorts of things. And there were different parts of the world where there were a lot of horses, but certainly in the United States, even by 1950, 20 million horses. That's a lot of horses. Veterinary medicine originated so that people could take care of horses and cattle. That was actually the main reason for having veterinarians. It's only been since about 19, say, 30 and later um, that we've really had an increase in veterinary medicine involving small animal patients, and really since about 1960 on. And so it's pretty interesting that it was really the need of those animals on the farm that drove the need for veterinary medicine. And then you can see, as we had more cars, we had more automation um, in our workforce, we had fewer and fewer horses. We get to about 1960, and we start to see a trend, an upward trend. So recreational use of horses, and probably many of the things that we're familiar that horses are used for. Although at K-State, we see a lot of horses that come in that are still work horses. They work on ranches, they work on feedlots, and sure, there are other vehicles that people could use, but sometimes horses are actually the best way to get around those areas. So they still do have um, many purposes. And again, about 2005 on, we've got between nine and 10 million horses. And then the last bullet point is that we do have a lot of horses that are out in the wild, particularly out in the western part of the United States. And those numbers are estimates as well. There are supposed to be about 30,000 horses that are wild, that are out in the western part of the United States, owned by the Bureau of Land Management. But those numbers fluctuate quite a bit. And so somewhere between 40, 60, some estimates are even greater than 70,000 horses are out on wild lands, open land. So there's a lot that goes in uh, to the horses that we have. 
And so we often do think about what horses do for a living because somebody's gonna call the veterinarian to come out and work on a horse, right? They're probably gonna be more likely to call a veterinarian and pay for that veterinary care if that horse really is of value to them, okay? And so thinking about what horses do is very helpful. It's not essential. Sometimes we have students that come to the veterinary college and they think that, you know, I, I don't know a lot about horses. I love horses. I think they're really cool and I find their diseases very interesting, but um, I, I didn't grow up riding horses. I'm not a horse person, so I probably can't be an equine veterinarian. And that is a myth. That is actually not true. People can learn at any time, any stage uh, of their training. And really having a familiarity, having a connection um, with clients and understanding what those horses do. But you don't have to be an expert in a Grand Prix level dressage to be able to take care of a horse and do an excellent job taking care of that horse from a medical perspective. So please don't let that dissuade you um, if you have an interest in equine practice and equine veterinary medicine. So what are these horses doing for a living in this picture? Racing. Excellent. Racing. Do you know specifically what kind of racing? Anybody know? So it's a few different options. So obviously they're not stadium jumping. Okay. So the, but sometimes horses do jump and race. So those are steeplechase horses. Um, they're not barrel racing. You guys have probably seen horses barrel racing in an arena doing the little clover leaf. That's unfamiliar. In this part of the country, actually, that's the most common type of racehorse that we see. They're still traveling at a very high speed. They have some of the same problems that these longer distance racehorses have, but that's kind of our racing horse population. Then we have thoroughbreds and quarter horses that are racehorses. And so those are examples of thoroughbred racehorses. They race in the United States and different parts of the country. They race in other parts of the world, and those horses are turf horses. They're probably running a mile or longer um, for their races, sometimes even up to two miles. And then quarter horses, you guys know why quarter horses are named quarter horses? Because they originally were designed to run a quarter of a mile, right? So they race over a quarter of a mile distance. So if you ever watch a quarter horse race, it's very different. They come out and they are flying out of that gate. And if you blink, you will miss that race because it's a quarter of a mile and it's gonna go very, very quickly. So different sorts of issues that we see with those horses um, because of what they're used for, their purpose. Um, and it's important, I think, as a veterinarian that you would have some familiarity. What's this guy do for a living? Yeah. Show jumping. Show jumping, yeah. So these are the Olympic horses that are Grand Prix jumpers and they jump five foot jumps. They jump sometimes five foot spreads. They go clean in their first round. They go fast and clean in their second round. So a good example of stadium jumping. But we have all different sorts of uses of horses and those are just a couple of examples. Okay, and um, so as an equine enthusiast, we do have quite a few options. I, I think that it's a little bit of a misnomer that if you're interested in horses, you're gonna automatically be an equine veterinarian. I think it's a great selection, a great career choice, um, but there are other options as well. And so I think understanding that is, is helpful. Um, so you could be a veterinarian, there are veterinary technicians that sometimes work exclusively on horses. At our teaching hospital, we have veterinary technicians that work just in the equine part of the hospital. Farriers obviously are gonna be working on horses quite a bit and they know an awful lot about horses. Um, sometimes people that ride and are quite good at riding and quite uh, dedicated to the profession become professional trainers. And so that's a way to really work with horses quite a bit. And then sometimes we'll have individuals that are in the pharmaceutical industry. And so you're in a great part of the world um, in the Kansas City area. You've got a lot of pharmaceutical companies and many of those have a veterinary um, specific uh, interest and in some of the products that they produce are equine specific and so they that there are some professionals um, that work in the pharmaceutical industry. We see horses for a variety of different reasons. I'm going to talk to you about a couple different examples of case examples of horses presenting to the teaching hospital. Um, but have you guys heard of colic 
anybody that's ridden horses? Yep. So what does colic mean? It's like kind of like when their organs get all knotted together. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes they'll have a displacement of their intestinal tract, absolutely. Colic in general terms means they have a belly ache. They go, oh my gosh, my belly is hurting me right now. And most commonly it's because of a gastrointestinal disturbance, and sometimes it's because of a displacement. But that's probably number one. We also see them, especially at the teaching hospital, for acute lameness and severe lameness type issues. Sometimes for esophageal obstruction or choke. You're going to hear an example of that, lacerations. We have a lot of fencing that sometimes um, can cause some injuries in horses. It's not uncommon that we'll have wounds that might be created, soft tissue injury. But the bottom line is all of these are reasons that we would uh, potentially see a patient in the teaching hospital and as an equine veterinarian why you would see them. So if you're thinking about, I don't know, maybe I want to be an equine veterinarian, maybe I want to be a veterinarian in general, but I don't know if I want to go into equine practice just yet, that is totally fine. Um, you can go to the ABMA website and they'll do an economic report every year. And so some of the information I'm sharing with you right now comes from that report for 2017. There are roughly 115,000 veterinarians in the United States right now. That seems like a lot. But for the whole number, the whole population of this country, it's not that many. So it's not that common of a profession, but there's a fair number out there. When we break it down into that different categories of where people might work, we've got about 68,000 or about two thirds of them that are gonna be in private veterinary practice. So what most of us are most familiar with as far as what veterinarians do for a living, working in a local practice, taking care of sick animals, um, and sometimes having a little bit of a preference over one species or one area of medicine. 6,700, that's really not very many, are gonna be at a university setting, uh, federal government, about 1,800, just under 2,000. Interestingly, the military is an option. And we have students at K-State that are uh, military students, and so they're going through veterinary college Veterinary college can be expensive, um, and at the end of, after they graduate, then they actually go into the military for four years, and they basically pay off their student loans with service, and they come out, and they don't have any debt. And so it's a really nice exchange. Sometimes they're working on military animals. Sometimes they're helping with food um, inspections. There are different areas where they, they might work in the military after graduation, but that is a nice option. You can see not that many people take that option, but I will say over time, we've seen that number increasing, and it has to do with the cost of veterinary education. And then we've got just under 3,500 that are in industry, and that's that pharmaceutical type of area. Then you might be thinking, well, what does it, how much, how long do I have to go to school if I'm gonna go to veterinary college? So I put this slide together um, from the perspective of an equine veterinarian, so an equine specialist, so some additional training after veterinary college. But to walk through it, what's the minimum? Everybody's gonna go K through 12 school. Yep, if you have to go to undergraduate college, you do, but you don't necessarily have to go for four years and you don't necessarily have to get a Bachelor of Science degree. What you need to do is complete your prerequisites. Okay, so those courses, that coursework that is required by the schools that you are applying to for veterinary college. Sometimes that can be completed if you are really motivated, maybe even in two, two and a half years. Sometimes people would prefer to get an undergraduate degree. They say, gosh, I think I'm gonna go to vet school, but I wanna make sure I get a degree in case I wanna do other things. I still have that degree. So that's why I have between two and four years, but it is flexible. Veterinary college is four years. Right now, all of the ABMA accredited colleges in the United States and elsewhere, um, Mexico and even European schools, um, those are gonna be four-year programs. None of them are less than that. Many are kind of looking at, could we do it in less than four years? Then if you decide after veterinary college that you wanna specialize in a certain area, maybe small animal surgery, maybe large animal medicine, whatever that area is, then you're gonna to have to do a little bit more training. That usually includes an internship, which is one year. Sometimes people do two internships. 
because after an internship, if you want to be a specialist, you have to do a residency. Residency training is very competitive to enter into residency training. At this point in time, it's most common for people to have to complete two internships to be competitive for a residency training program. Then a residency is going to be between two and three years, and actually some of them are even four years. Ophthalmology is looking at increasing theirs to four years. And then sometimes people will also do graduate school, so maybe a master's or a PhD. You might do that concurrently with your advanced training. You might do that in addition to your advanced training. So you can see, you could be in school and training for quite a few years, but that is all just a, a bit optional as far as what you do, even leading up to veterinary college and after veterinary college. But that's kind of what we're looking at. After veterinary college, when people go into veterinary practice, they often think about where they would like to practice. And so there are many different factors that would come into play on where you might choose to work. Um, but one of them may pertain to the economy of the area where you are going. And so this is from that ABMA economic report for 2017. And just showing regionally that we do have different areas of the country that basically can be categorized based on the economy of that area. And it doesn't mean it's good or bad, it just means in different areas there are differences in kind of the caseload and the clientele that might be interested or willing um, to invest in animals. And so you might think, gosh, I just want to work on animals. I don't want to worry about that money part. But it's really important to think about that money part because we have to think about how our services are valued by that local group, those individuals that are going to bring their animals to us and recognize that it is a business and it's something that we really work very hard at as far as providing a very good service, doing the best that we can for our patients because we want those clients to continue to come back to us. And so this is something to think about as far as the business end of veterinary medicine. And that's something that is really quite a bit different than what you learn even in veterinary college. We have a couple of business courses that our students take, but that's an area where we're looking at even expanding because the business component of veterinary medicine is so important and so important for individuals that come out of veterinary college. And the reality is that often the amount of money that people can spend on their animals with a veterinarian is considered disposable income. So that means it's not essential for their day-to-day -day life, um, but it's something in addition to what they normally would do, and it probably enhances their quality of life. But what's interesting is, even from a medical standpoint, a human medical standpoint, there is more and more evidence building how important it is for people to have an animal, have multiple animals, as far as things like um, reduced obesity, diabetes, blood pressure, for people to come home and feel great about seeing that animal or getting their horse tacked up and going out for a ride on a beautiful day, taking the dog out for a walk a couple of times a day. Those are things that are really good. They help us feel well, so emotionally it's very good for us, and physically it's very good to help people stay healthier. And so there is good evidence that people really should um, have animals in their lives. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the equine end of things, and so I'm going to get into some specifics on equine practice, but I think the other thing to recognize is that sometimes we think about, gosh, people are only going to call the veterinarian when they have a problem with their animal, and it's going to be a really serious, really big problem, and how are we going to handle that, and that seems like a really stressful job. But the reality is very similar to small animal practice. There are a lot of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that are extremely pleasurable. We have great contact with our uh, horse owners, our, our clients, horse trainers, and a lot of times it's to help keep the horses healthy, and that's what we're trying to do um, from a veterinary service perspective. And so what are those things that people are gonna do to help keep them healthy? Things like just an annual exam. We are going to want to be involved with horses at least once a year, to make sure their physical exam is normal, pick up any problems, if there is something that's going on, like a little heart murmur or something, we pick it up early, our chances of being able to address that issue um, are gonna be much better than if we wait until we have serious problems. 
equine vaccines and deworming and teeth floating are routine things that we do for all horses. Um, there are going to be variable protocols that we use depending on the use of the horse and the desire of that horse owner, but th these are things that we do on a very routine basis. Breeding, any horse that is of value and um, really could uh, contribute to the genetic pool of that discipline or breed, um, often breeding is a large part of equine practice. And so if anybody's ever been over in Kentucky and seen some of these thoroughbred farms, you recognize very quickly how important breeding is to that industry. So um, that's, that's an exciting and a really fun and rewarding part of veterinary, veterinary practice. And then little things like um, if we're taking a horse to an event or maybe we're taking the horse from Kansas over to Missouri, we have to have health papers. That means we have to have a current Coggins. We have to make sure that that horse doesn't have equine infectious anemia. And we have to make sure we've got a health certificate that said that horse is really nice and healthy today and it's okay for that horse to be around other horses. So just some examples of things that we do um, that help to keep horses healthy. And then sometimes we do have to have horses come to a place like Kansas State to the veterinary teaching hospital and uh, we would, think we would uh, classify that as urgent, sometimes even emergency care. It can't even wait till tomorrow in some cases. We have to load that horse up and bring that horse in right now. And so again, sometimes things like injury, serious lameness, infectious disease, sometimes respiratory disease, gastrointestinal disease, colic signs, those sorts of things, and trying to get on those horses as quick as we can so that we can hopefully get them uh, back on track and have them be nice and healthy. Questions at this point? Okay, very good. Well, we're gonna talk about a couple cases and um, I chose these because I thought they were good examples of why we might see horses come to the clinic um, and help you learn a little bit about how we approach these kinds of cases. So if you guys have questions, please let me know. The first one we're gonna talk about is a foal. And so um, most of the time foals are born as early in the year as possible. So as close to January as possible because um, often they're gonna be sold uh, as yearlings. And the closer they can be to a full year of age at the time they're sold as yearlings, the bigger, the more robust they're gonna be and um, the better prospect that they are going to be. So this foal was born early in the year. I think he was actually born in about February. But he was about three months old at the time that he presented to us. And he actually lives in the Kansas City area. And he had had a history for about two weeks. He wasn't quite right. Owners take outstanding care of him. And uh, they knew that he wasn't right. They were keeping an eye on him. And they had been working very closely with their veterinarian at home in the Kansas City area. And so we, we call that person the referring veterinarian. That's the veterinarian that works with the client and the horse at home, but if they need a little bit more help with that case, they actually refer it over to a place like Kansas State University. And so that veterinarian had identified that this colt had had a fever, he had had some soft feces, so he's a little bit worried about his GI tract, and he had put him on some medications, specifically some antibiotics, but that fever just kept coming back, and so he was concerned, and so he went ahead and referred him over to K-State for a little more workup to see if we could figure out what was going on with this cult and then to go ahead and um, treat that patient. So a little bit more as far as this horse, his name is Navy CB. Um, he's sired by a horse named Mitch Shipman and so he's a thoroughbred, intended to be a thoroughbred racehorse. So even though he's very young, he does have some value even as a young colt. And based on the way that thoroughbred racing is, it's a little bit tricky, but um, people like to have them born in a state where they have racing because then if they race in that state, when that horse wins money, some of that money actually goes back to the person that owned that horse at the time that they were born. It's called Breeders' Awards. And so this colt, although the farm is in the Kansas City area, the mayor would go to Illinois, have the foal, so that the idea was that then several years later that foal would ultimately race in Illinois. Um, they transported the mare in the fall to Lexington, Kentucky, um, about a month of age the fall was at that point, and then they came back to Kansas City. So in a three-month period of time, that's a lot of traveling. That's more, a lot more traveling than I might do in a three-month period of time, and this was just a little fall. So again, he was born in Illinois. 
Then they went over to Kentucky. Then they came back to Kansas City. So, um, and now he's having some health issues. And we're going to come back to that. But sometimes that historical information is really important because oftentimes we're trying to solve a mystery when we're working on our patients. They can't talk to us. We can see what's wrong at the day that they present to us, but we have to try to figure out what's been going on with them and what's most likely their problem, and hopefully prevent things from happening um, in the future. So when we think about thoroughbreds, we think about what they're used for, and that's something that is relevant even at this stage of working on a patient because this client is probably thinking, oh gosh, I've been treating this patient now for two weeks, and now we're gonna go over to Kansas State University and that's not gonna be free. And what is this horse's value? And ultimately, what is this horse's value going to be? And again, I know it seems like a common theme I keep bringing up, but sometimes the economics of the value of that animal comes into play um, for where we're gonna go as far as veterinary management. But um, there is good evidence in the literature that even a foal at this age with the disease we ultimately diagnosed them with, even being pretty sick, it's still a very reasonable investment to get them through this disease process that there's a good chance that they're gonna still be okay and be a racehorse. And so that's what we're shooting for, and that's how we are addressing a patient like this. And although thoroughbreds are used for racing most commonly, oftentimes if they're not racehorses or even after they're racehorses, there are a lot of other really um, useful ways for them to be um, very pleasurable riding horses. So when ABCV arrived to us, he did have a fever. Normal temperature on a horse is right around 100 degrees, and he was at 103.5. That's a pretty good fever. That's definitely something to take note of, and again, it had been going on for a couple of weeks at this point. His heart rate was elevated at 120 beats per minute, so that says that he has some physiologic stress and illness going on for that heart rate to be a bit elevated. And he was huffing and puffing a little bit, even coming off the trailer and then he settled down in the stall, but still he was breathing faster than he should have been and he was breathing harder than he should have been. When we listen to him with the stethoscope, so just like when we go to the doctor and they say, take a few deep breaths, we can't ask them to take deep breaths, but we still try to take a really good listen to their lungs and we could hear what are called crackles. So abnormal sounds in his airways that indicate that he had a little bit of fluid and mucousy material down in those lower airways, it would suggest that he probably had primary respiratory disease that was accounting for his illness. And so I say crackles present bilaterally, that means on both sides of his chest, everywhere we listened, we could hear those abnormal pulmonary sounds. And so some other things that we did, we went ahead and got some blood from him. We get what's called a minimum database. So we're trying to get some baseline information about overall how this cult is doing. So we run a CDC, a serum chemistry, and a blood gas analysis. And what we found on him was that he had an elevated white blood cell count. White blood cells are our little soldiers in our bloodstream to help to go fight off infection. And if those soldiers are called to battle, then they increase in number. They call all their friends. And so the number of white blood cells increases in circulation when they're fighting off infection. And so he had an elevated white blood cell count that said, yep, he's, he's definitely got infection. He had that fever. Now he's got this elevated white blood cell count. He also had elevation of his protein levels, which are also consistent with trying to fight off an infection. And then he also had low blood oxygen. So we got an arterial blood sample and the oxygen level was low. Does anybody know why his oxygen level might have been low? Because whatever was in his lungs would block oxygen. Bingo, absolutely perfect. So his lungs aren't able to work properly. He can't transfer gas from his airways into his bloodstream properly. So overall his blood oxygen level is low. We call that hypoxemia. So we wanted to do a little bit more diagnostically to approach what was happening in his lungs. And so this is just a diagram showing where the lungs sit in a horse. And so this is an adult horse, um, and this is uh, basically where the lungs sit. When we take an x-ray, a big horse, a thousand pound horse is a lot larger than you or I or a foal. A foal is actually a little bit closer to our size, right around 100 pounds or so, a little bit more than that. 
Um, but what I wanted to show you is how we take x-rays. So we usually take a series of x-rays in order to get the whole lung feel. And the next case that you're gonna see, I'm gonna show you some of those examples. But for this guy, um, I am gonna show you some thoracic radiographs. And I just wanted to um, help you understand that sometimes we have to take more than one radiograph to be able to get that entire lung field um, in our thoracic radiographs. So this is a relatively uh, normal radiograph, thoracic radiograph. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at that back portion of the lung, okay? So kind of back here. And if you can think about a radiograph, what it's trying to do is it's basically measuring the density of tissue that we are looking at. And so if we have air-filled lung, right, healthy air-filled lung, it's gonna have low density. That x-ray beam goes through it, and what we see is very black, very clear. That's normal. The air-filled lung is gonna be black under normal conditions. If we have infection or fluid that are in those lungs, it actually increases the density of those lungs. It makes it harder for those x-ray beams to penetrate. And so instead of being nice and black and clear, it becomes a little bit more gray or sometimes even a little bit white because that x-ray beam couldn't get through, okay? So again, this is an example of one that looks pretty darn good. You see some of the gray in there, that's gonna be things like blood vessels and some of the airway walls that you can see, but in general, relatively clear. And this is an example of one of the radiographs that's a little bit further forward um, right over the heart. And that's a really nice, clean, completely normal radiograph right over the heart base. And if I said this is our cult, do you think that's normal or abnormal? Abnormal. That is abnormal, yep. And so what I want you to notice is in this area, can you guys appreciate how it looks a little bit like there are these white fuzzy sort of cotton ball looking things. So those are areas where there are actually abscesses forming in this colt's lungs. His infection are forming abscesses in his lungs. And that's what it looks like on x-ray. He should have, it should be all nice and pretty black, pretty clear, um, but instead he has these areas of infection that you can see diffusely through those lung fields, okay? And this is just a little bit different view from the other side, but pretty similar to what we saw on that last film. You can still see these kind of cotton ball um, infiltrates, and that's where the infection is. Okay? So then we think about what's going on with our patient when we try to be organized in our approach, because we don't want to forget anything. We don't want to miss anything. We want to make sure that we've got everything organized. We're considering all possibilities for what could be wrong, so that hopefully we can treat them properly and have them get better and have a full recovery. So this guy had a fever, he had tachycardia, which is the medical term for increased heart rate, tachypnea, increased respiratory rate. He had abnormal pulmonary sounds, remember those crackles that were present bilaterally. He was hypoxemic and he had abnormal thoracic radiographs. And what helps us here is when we do this, we make this problem list. We say, gosh, what sort of problems could account for all of those things? And most commonly, we would see that with a patient that has pneumonia. Okay, Pneumonia meaning infection of the lungs based on fever, the abnormal pulmonary sounds, abnormal radiographs, elevated white blood cell count, hypoxemia. Those are all going to be consistent with pneumonia as his number one primary problem. But then we have to think about, OK, What's causing the pneumonia? We have a couple of different things that could cause pneumonia, especially in a foal. So we think about bacterial, viral, parasitic. And when we write it down and we really think about all those possibilities, again, hopefully we're not going to miss any possibility, and we always rank them. So the most likely is going to be highest on the list. And so at the top of our bacterial list, we have a bacteria called Rhodococcus equi that we see in foals bulls that have spent time on breeding farms and bulls that get exposed to this bacteria very early in life. We have other bacteria, other viruses, parasitic disease that could cause infection like this but are less likely, okay? So now we have to say, okay, how are we gonna know exactly what's causing pneumonia in this bull? 
And so what we do is we wanna collect some of the secretions, some of the mucus out of the respiratory tract from this fold. We do what's called a transtracheal wash. And so this is an example, a diagram of a horse. And what we do is we put a little bit of fluid into the trachea and then we aspirate that back. We send it to the lab and we do a bacterial culture on it. Not only a bacterial culture to identify what the bacteria is, but we actually then take that bacteria that grows and we put it in the presence of different antibiotics and we see what kind of antibiotic can get rid of or kill that bacteria. That's the antibiotic we want our patient to be on because that's how we're gonna clear the infection in that patient. So just an example, we have to clip them. This is a sterile procedure, sterile gloves, sterile instruments. It's, it takes us about five minutes to do the procedure. It's not a hard procedure, but it's a really important one and we wanna be absolutely sterile because we wanna know that if we grow bacteria, the only place that bacteria could have come from was from the airway of that patient. So we wanna make sure that we don't contaminate that sample in any way. Lo and behold, culture came back and we grew Rhodococcus equi on this cult. And that's the bacteria that we worry about and we most commonly see that bacteria causing pneumonia in folds. We got our antibi antibiotic sensitivity. Again, we grow that bacteria with antibiotics and we found that two of the antibiotics we usually use for this bacteria called clarithromycin and riboflavin, this cult is sensitive to. And guess what the name of that racehorse is? Navy CB. Okay, so he recovered. This can be a very serious bacterial infection. This is one that is not easy to get rid of, but treating them usually in about six to eight weeks which if you're the owner that has to treat that patient several times a day at the farm, um, that's a long time. And especially when you're buying all of that medication, it can be expensive. But this colt made a complete recovery and he went on and he got broken and went into training and became a racehorse. And um, he did do what's called break his maiden. So he won at least one race and ultimately he won just under $46,000. So, um, just a little bit on Rhodococcus equi, it is a bacteria, we call it a ubiquitous. It's very common. Um, it's in the soil, so it's kind of everywhere on horse farms, but not everybody gets sick from it. So if you're thinking, well, why did he get sick? It's an interesting question. It has to do with him being a foal, and especially early in life, their immune system isn't as good as an adult or even an older foal. And um, there are other risk factors that they get a lot of that bacteria exposed to them at a critical time when they don't have proper immunity. And usually the exposure does occur in the first week of life. So it occurs very early in life. But what's interesting is that these foals don't usually show us signs of being sick until they're one month, two months, three months of age. So it takes that long. They've actually been building those abscesses in their lungs for quite a period of time before they start to show us things like fever and lethargy and sometimes even a cough. And so that pneumonia um, is the most common form of disease in these folds. And so if I ask the question, where do you think he got exposed to Rhodococcus equi? Kentucky, Illinois, Kansas, or California? You guys remember where he was born? He was born in Illinois, exactly, yep. So he probably got exposed in Illinois. We could, we could, if we didn't know a lot about the bacteria, we might think, gosh, he got sick in Kansas. Maybe he got sick in Kentucky. He was there a few weeks ago. But no, nope, he got sick all the way back in Illinois. And this is when he shows his clinical signs. Okay, great news, he did really well. Wanna hear one more case? Okay. One more case. Next weekend, a really big racing weekend um, where thoroughbred race from all over the world. These are the best horses. Next week, um, the Breeders' Cup, it's Friday and Saturday. It's at Del Mar Racetrack in California, and it's a really exciting day. And this is what most thoroughbred owners are really shooting for um, when they are breeding their horses and hoping that they could be a really successful racehorse and to go to those big, big races. So the next one is the opposite end. So we're going to talk about a 23-year-old Arabian gelding. This owner adores this horse, takes excellent care of him, 
Um, but unfortunately, he had a little bit of a, a rough go of it one night at supper time. And so do you guys know how long horses live? So most of us would say probably 25, maybe 30. Past 30, that's a pretty old horse. Sometimes they make it into their mid-30s. Rarely do they make it to 40. We just had a pony in our clinic that we lost this past summer, and he was 40 or 41, and he was the oldest in our practice area. So that's really pushing it. That means somebody is taking really good care of him. 23 is getting up there, but probably even 20 years ago, we would have said, gosh, that's an old horse. But in this day and age, there are a lot of 20-ish year old horses that are still in riding, still doing great. And so, um, and he was, he was still a riding horse at this time. You guys know what Arabians are used for? So they often originate from, and their bloodlines originate from the Middle East, and they're very tough horses, and they're often used for racing purposes, completely different kind of racing, so kind of endurance type racing, longer distance type racing, but they, they can be extremely valuable horses, and their bloodlines are really important, and they're Egyptian Arabians that um, go back many, many generations, but they are really good at long distance. So if you know anybody that does any endurance racing, they're often going to have an Arabian or an Arabian cross. But they're a nice breed that can be used for a variety of different purposes. This horse is just a, a nice riding horse, trail rides, local riding, a little bit of dressage, a little bit of jumping. Um, but he basically lived outdoors most of the time. He did have some brown hay available, and he would get soaked alfalfa pellets in the evening. And so on this particular evening, he had been fed, and then somebody noticed him in the stall, and he was kind of circling in the stall, and they noticed that he had some discharge coming out of his nostrils and even out of his mouth, and he stuck his head out, and he was, he was trying to swallow, trying to swallow, he was drooling quite a bit, and he just seemed like he was kind of panicked. So they called their veterinarian, said, come on, can you give us a hand? Veterinarian came out. Um, evaluated the horse and was worried that he had been eating his supper and he had actually obstructed, so choked on some of that food in his esophagus. So the veterinarian did what most of us do and gave a little bit of sedation, so to relax that horse, tried to pass a tube, so if anybody's ever seen a horse that gets a tube passed for colic signs or sometimes for deworming, that tube goes into one nostril, the horse swallows it, and it goes all the way down to their stomach. And this veterinarian could get it part of the way down, but then hit an obstruction, hit a blockage, and couldn't get it any further, and said, I can't get it. You need to go to K-State and see if they can give you a hand. So they went ahead, loaded him up, and when he got to us, he actually um, was still on a, a little bit sedated. So some of these findings were a little bit off just because he had been sedated, but his temperature was a little bit cool. And actually to feel his extremities, he felt a little bit cool. He was actually a little bit shocky. So he was a very, very sick horse at this point. His heart rate wasn't too bad. It was at 44 beats per minute, which is normal for an adult. But again, he had some sedation, which actually artificially lowered that heart rate. His respiratory rate was increased. He was breathing pretty hard. He was coughing. And he was really struggling a little bit. His nostrils were flared. He was breathing hard. When we looked at his membranes, his membranes were dry. They should be nice and moist and pink, and they were pale in color, and he really did show us signs that he was pretty shocking. When we tried to feel his pulse, his pulse pressure was very weak, again, consistent with some shock signs. So similar to the fall that I just talked about, we got some blood and we sent it to the lab. He arrived, and it was middle of the night. It was about midnight when he arrived, um, but he did have a low white blood cell count, and so sometimes early in the course of infection, the white blood cell count drops because all of the white blood cells are very quickly recruited to one site of infection. And that's what happened here. After a long-term infection, like the full that you just saw, then the white blood cells actually come up to fight off that infection. So you have a low white blood cell count, very low, very serious, um, consistent with it. He was really reacting to something um, he was a bit stressed and dehydrated based on his serum chemistry. Similar to the foal, he had a low blood oxygen uh, level. So he had severe hypoxemia at this stage. 
um, due to severe lung disease. So at this stage, this seems a little bit confusing, doesn't it? It seemed like at home he was having trouble eating, couldn't get that tooth passed, and now he seems like he's really having trouble with his lungs and having evidence of respiratory disease. And so we might think about, we say well, when we hear hoofbeats, we want to think about a horse, but don't forget about zebras. Okay, sometimes it's not actually what we expect. It could be something a little bit different. And so what happened with this patient is, what do you think happens to the food material if he obstructed his esophagus, if he still tried to eat a few bites or he had saliva in his mouth, where do you think that might go? In his lungs. Into his lungs, exactly, into his lungs. And so he had developed acute aspiration pneumonia which was actually much more serious than his esophageal obstruction. And that's what sometimes happens with these cases. Sometimes they relieve that obstruction very quickly and they really don't aspirate very much, but everything that we found with him said that he had very severe aspiration. And so he had obstructed, he could have had something else going on, but based on the fact that he had been normal, he ate his supper, and then he had this problem it all suggested that it was because of eating that supper and getting it stuck in his esophagus. And so that's all I've listed here is that if there's an obstruction, that food material is gonna go right into his airway or his trachea and cause acute aspiration pneumonia, very severe aspiration pneumonia. And so we went ahead and did some testing on him. Um, one of the things that we did early on was an ultrasound. So we'd just do a sonogram of his chest wall, through his chest wall. And this is what a normal sonogram would look like. And this is kind of the surface of his lung. And this is an example where there's a, a lot of irregularity. And that's what happens when they have acute pneumonia. So an example of in real time, you can see that gliding white line going back and forth. This is a normal horse. And so that's what it looks like when they're nice and healthy. It just goes back and forth, and that's air-filled lung going back and forth with each breath. And then when they have pneumonia, this is an example of one where instead of having just normal air-filled lung, this is all evidence of localized infection. And so that's what he looked like in the dependent, the lowest portion of his lung because of that aspiration pneumonia. We also took some x-rays of him, so you guys have seen the normal x-ray already on the left, and this is what his x-ray looked like. So this is just over his heart, and you can see you can hardly see any black or air-filled lung, and that's because he has material, food material, fluid that has come into that airway and caused him to have severe pneumonia. And this is looking a little bit further, further back at that lung field, and in this portion, it's pretty normal. But can you guys appreciate down here, it looks a lot whiter and grayer. And that's because in that lower portion of his lung, that's where all the food material went and sat and caused him to have that aspiration pneumonia. We went ahead and put a camera into his esophagus because we wanted to see uh, what his esophagus looked like. So this is our endoscope. It's a long camera. And we can do this in standing courses, just a little bit of sedation. We pass it into their nostril and we go right down and look in their esophagus. And so we knew he had choked to start this problem off. And this is inside of his esophagus and he had developed an erosion. So it had, it had caused an ulcer of his esophagus and even had a linear erosion here um, because of that food material that had been stuck in the esophagus. So he had esophageal obstruction as his primary problem and then secondarily had the severe aspiration pneumonia. So what do we do about this? We put him on a lot of supportive care, but most importantly, we need to clear that infection in his lungs. Unlike the last case where we only had one bacteria to worry about, because of all of the material that had gone into his lungs, we needed to use what's called broad spectrum antibiotics. So we hit them with a broad coverage of antibiotics to try to clear a variety of different kinds of bacteria. The good news is he was on oxygen, antibiotics, supportive care, but after about 10 days, he got better and better each day, and he made a complete recovery and did get to go home and went back to being a riding horse. And so he had a really favorable outcome. This is a problem we do worry about more in older horses than younger horses. Horses can have changes in their dentition 
or in their teeth. And when I said we try to keep horses healthy as veterinarians, one of the things we do is float their teeth once a year. If their teeth get sharp um, and uneven, sometimes have a little bit harder time eating, that can predispose them to having problems like choke um, and esophageal obstruction. So appropriate dental care and being careful that they don't fold their food. Sometimes we just get really excited about supper time and they eat pretty quickly. So I think that being a veterinarian, regardless of what area you work in, um, it's a really important part of our society for a variety of different reasons. And I would certainly encourage you to consider it as a profession. And then as equine veterinarians, I think that we really have a quite rewarding um, professional uh, position based on the routine, the urgent, emergent, emergency type cases that we see. And as equine veterinarians, we like to be familiar with what horses do for a living, but you don't have to be an equine professional exclusively to be able to work on horses. So I would encourage you to think about working on horses. If you haven't been over to Manhattan, we have a wonderful teaching hospital, but in the last year, we also built an equine performance testing center. And so this is a view of that EPTC which opened last March. And so we have a really nice area where people can come and ride horses and have them evaluated um, if they need some veterinary care. Questions? So if, if uh, anyone wants to become an econ veterinarian, you probably missed this earlier, what, what are some things that they can do to, to kind of find out if that's what they want to do in the future? Yeah. Excellent. And that will help them maybe get into that school if that's better. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. Dr. Adams has a great question. And that is, if you guys are sitting there thinking, I don't know, that sounds kind of interesting. Maybe I'd like to do that. What I would encourage you to do is, number one, do the best you can in school. Try to get the best grades you can. Because that is really important. And find opportunities where you can work with veterinarians. I heard that um, we have some opportunities with therapeutic riding centers in the area. There are ranches, riding stables. But working with a veterinarian, and usually if you ask um, to shadow with an equine veterinarian, you can learn a bit about what they're doing. At your stage, you may not be able to do much other than observe. And sometimes it even takes a few years to be able to do that, usually at the age of 14 or older. Um, but we have students that come to the teaching hospital and they'll spend a half a day or a day or sometimes multiple days and they'll shadow in the clinic and kind of see what's happening. And I think that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what it's like to be a veterinarian. So that's probably a really good starting point. And if that seems like that just really rocks your world and is really fun, then I would encourage you to look for opportunities as you get closer to that um, college decision and even over the summer months try to work in a veterinary practice, work with a veterinarian, and really learn what the day-to-day -day responsibilities are like. And I think that'll give you a good, good um, example of what you might be um, headed for in your future. Other questions? Okay, well, thanks for coming over today. Check oh, Kelly, Kelly and make sure she doesn't have a chat. I sent her a text to see if she had any questions. But Kelly, you have any questions? Oh, she does chat too. Oh, she's just giving this report. 20 okay. people in attendance at CAPS. Okay. So there were 20 other people besides you guys that were coming to listen to see what Dr. Davis had to say. So join me in thanking Dr. Davis for her time and her expertise. Thank you.